Okay, I think um, we can slowly start uh, uh, this afternoon's uh, workshop. I would like to welcome our panelists and uh, the audience to Theorizing Crisis Imaginaries, which is a workshop jointly organized by Gordela Weiss Sussex of the Institute of Modern Languages Research at the University of London and the uh, Humanities Institute at University College Dublin. My name is Anne Fuchs, and I'm going to co-chair today's proceedings together with Gordela. Uh, before introducing our panelists, I just want to um, mention a few housekeeping matters. So can I ask, just to remind our panelists to switch off their mics when they are not speaking, but please leave your cameras on. And uh, in terms of discussion, we will have the three papers consecutively followed by an extended discussion uh, at the end of panel one, and where we will hopefully draw out key points and debate the phenomenon and concept of crisis from our various disciplinary perspectives. Panel members should raise their hands and switch on their mics when they want to make a contribution, and the audience is invited to use the chat function to ask questions or raise points, and Gordela will attempt to, to feed in as many uh, audience questions as possible. Okay, so that's really it in terms of housekeeping. So uh, let's begin by introducing the speakers of our first panel. It's my really great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Professor Janet Reutemann, who is Professor of Anthropology at the New School for Social Research in New York. She is the author of Fiscal Disobedience and Anthropology of Economic Regulation in Central Africa, a book which was published with Princeton University Press and offered an analysis of emergent forms of economic regulations in the Chad Basin. She is also author of her very influential book, Anti-Crisis, a book which has influenced my thinking and I think the thinking of many other panel members on, on how we conceptualize uh, 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 crises and crises as an object of knowledge. And she uses the 2007 and 2008 global recession um, as a point of departure for her analysis. Her current research focuses on emergent fintech, emergent domestic capital markets, and middle class politics in Africa. She is also director of the Platform Economics Research Group. So, Janet, you're very, very welcome. We're looking forward to your contribution. Our second speaker today is Ansgar Nuning, professor of English and American literature and the study of culture at Justus Liebig University in Germany, and also the founding director of the International Graduate Center for the Study of Culture in 2006. In 2017, Ansgar received an honorary doctorate from the University of Stockholm for his distinguished contributions in the field of literary and cultural studies, as well as for his leading role in changing doctoral education. He has published very widely on English literature, literary and cultural theory, and of course on narratology. Anybody who has an interest in narratology will have come across Ansgar's work. He's the editor of various book series and co-editor of the peer-reviewed journal Germanisch Romanische Monatsschrift. Our third speaker uh, in panel one is Joseph Ford. Joseph is lecturer in French studies at the IMLR. His first book, Writing the Black Decade, Conflict and Criticism in Francophone Algerian Literature, challenges dominant understandings of literature as illuminating or emancipatory. He argues that writers and literary texts can in fact restrain our understanding of the world during a time of conflict and further entrench the polarized discourses that lead to conflict in the first place, which is of course a very provocative thesis. His wider research interests are in post-colonial studies, world literature, literary translation and migration. Joseph, we are also very much looking forward to your paper on multilingual community engagement during uh, COVID-19. But can I now ask uh, Janet to begin this first panel with crisis today? And can I ask everybody else to switch off 
their mites. Thank you. Thank you so much, and thank you for the introduction. Um, thanks everyone for logging on at these various times of the day, I'm sure wherever you are. I'm, I'm gonna try and be as brief as I can. Um, the, uh, these are very embarrassing slides, uh, so just bear with. Um, what I wanna first do is uh, linger on this question of naming. Um, that is by calling an event or a situation a crisis. So I want to do this because naming a set of events or a situation a crisis, I mean, that just sounds like a mere semantic act, right? Like this thing is a crisis, you know. Um, but, you know, as I illustrate in Antichrisis in the book that was uh, mentioned in, in the introduction, the proposition or the claim, this is a crisis, right, in quotations, is a logical operation. It is, and this is really my main point, it's not a mere empirical observation. So just to explain that very, very briefly, on the one hand, we could have an empirical ob observation, right? Which is like virus. Based, and that is based on a distinction, virus, not virus. And that is different, fundamentally different from a conceptual claim such as the virus is a crisis. So the point, and really this is all I have to say, but, but I'll, I'll say a few other things, but the point is that a virus is not naturally occurring as a crisis. And saying that it is one, right, claiming that there is a crisis brings an empirical observation into the conceptual realm. So I, without belaboring the point, we could have at the empirical level, right, like virus or COVID-19, empirical observation. And then on the second level, the ways that we qualify that empirical observation as entailing a crisis, which is a conceptual claim. Could I have the next slide? So today we seem to be in a situation of protracted crises, each of which corresponds to an empirical observation, right? We have the global health crisis, which seems to correspond to the empirical observation virus or COVID-19, environmental crisis, which seems to correspond to the empirical observation fires, warming oceans, etc. cetera. So it's an economic crisis that seems to correspond to the empirical observation intensifying inequalities, and standing in the United States, I can say firmly political crisis, which seems to correspond to rise in populism and autocratic rule. So we can do research on these crises, right? I mean, and we, and we do. So for example, this is sort of my first book's point is that there's financial crisis and we, we researchers go describe the impact of the crisis on various populations or communities. And then we have publications on how the financial crisis impacted people. Or, and this is what I set out to do, we can ask constitutive questions about the concept of crisis, right? What are the effects of the claim, the claim or the proposition? And this is different from how does the crisis impact people? So when crisis is declared, what questions does it enable and what sorts of questions does it foreclose? What is at stake when we claim crisis? So crisis is posited really as a condition of our times without any consideration of the stakes of positing our world in these terms. What we need to explore, and this is really a big question today, are the stakes of those claims. So this definitely involves accounts of actors' uses of the term, right, and account of discursive practice, right, how people use the term and narrative acts. But it also, and more importantly, is an account of the tangible effects of the concept itself on the formulation of truth claims. So today, crisis signifies global health pandemic and nothing could seem more normal, right? The ultimate crisis for humans is not having an immune response to a virus. That is literally an existential crisis. Could I have the next slide, please? But I want to refer briefly to the work of um, Andrew Lakoff, um, who's at uh, University of California. He's written about what he calls the global health security assemblage or in short preparedness. And that involves both international health agencies and biodefense agencies. And um, Andy traces the concept of emerging diseases starting the late 1980s when the HIV AIDS pandemic upended the assumption that infectious diseases had been contained by public health measures. And the conclusion, and don't forget, this is two decades ago, two decades ago, is that our future global ecology, right, will entail continuous 
emergence of new diseases for which we have no immunity. Ebola, SARS, MERS, Zika, etc. And by the late 1990s, at least in US biodefense initiative, prepared for an eventual bioterrorist attack, at that time it was anthrax, and a whole global biosecurity apparatus was put in place. Could I have the next slide? So I likewise want to refer briefly to the work of Levin and Sanger regarding the AIDS pandemic. Slide, please, the next one. So I'm just going to read this. I'm sorry to do this to you, but um, this is Bryna Sanger writing today. So she co-authored the uh, first book on the AIDS pandemic. And then she wrote on a blog post recently about COVID-19. And she says, the COVID-19 crisis, despite its broad spread and massive economic impact, is not so different from many of the public health crises the United States has faced over the years. But the current environment of political denial, weak and uneven policy response, poor and confusing communication, and contentious in intergovernmental relations are predictable and typical threats to effective response. They are in many ways challenges of management and competence more than they are failures of science or failures of public health. So the point I'd like to make from that is that while we clearly don't know from an epidemiological point of view, COVID-19, we could say that that would be an epistemological crisis, right? We can't, the, our knowledge production around this thing, right, is problematic. Although now we have a vaccine, so I, that, that is even an under consideration. But the point I wanna make is that we do know pandemics. So then why this pandemic crisis today? We had an entire biomedical biosecurity apparatus you know, was put in place to, to face this. And that's the primary question, I think, regarding what is at stake. Could I have the next slide, please? Social theory tells us that crisis should imply a turning point, right? Crisis, according to social theory, involves epistemological transformation. Social theory, for social theory then, crisis signifies the transformation of knowledge production or the production of true statements. And my view is that if crisis obtains, there would be no means of representation, right? Language and all other forms of representation would fail us. We would not have a vaccine for certain. So we should think about how by declaring the COVID-19 pandemic a crisis, for example, certain truth claims no longer hold while others are reconfirmed. And in the case of COVID-19, the crisis claim implicitly reconfirms norms about public health. I'm not sure there is epistemological transformation once again. At least in the United States, the crisis claim is implicated in very serious racial and socioeconomic disparities in public health in the United States, which are the norm. There are differences in living and work conditions, differential access to medical care and to education. And this is the norm. So we all see this in examples across the world, right? That having a robust public health and social welfare state is a condition of avoiding massive social and economic consequences of the virus. Those consequences are unemployment, food insecurity, the exacerbation of inequalities. And significantly, and I think this is actually really interesting, I just learned this, this measure of public welfare is not a norm. It's not a global norm. It's not included in the global health security index. So likewise, the politics of claims to crisis is made quite stark when we consider certain questions like why was Ebola taken to be a crisis, quote, for Africa and not really posited as a global health crisis. So these are just some general remarks and provocations for, uh, for further research. I think it would be worth taking time to study the effects of the claim to crisis in the context of COVID-19 um, it's certainly research for our time. Um, I think I'm going to stop there. I'm not quite sure how I'm doing on time, but I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And you're very much on time. Good. 50 seconds left, in fact. So thanks very much for, for your um, very succinct uh, exposition um, of what is at stake in, in the crisis discourse today. Without much ado, I'm gonna hand over to Ansgar Nuning, who is, I think, going to enter a dialogue with you and about your book. His paper is entitled, Crisis Compared to What? Competing Narratives of the Coronavirus Pandemic as an Epistemological Crisis. So Ansgar, please 
Thank you very much, Anna, uh, Godila, and Kathy, for the excellent job you have done in organizing this event. It's lovely to see you all, albeit only virtually. Uh, I should also like to thank all of you for joining us today and for discussing with us what I consider to be a really timely topic. Since we only have about eight or 10 minutes each, I decided to couch my short presentation in the very apodictic but hopefully clear form of 10 hypotheses about mainly crisis narratives. The first five, I shall attempt to summarize some of the main ideas of about half a dozen articles I've published on that topic between 2007 and 2014. The second set of five hypotheses focuses more specifically on the title that is competing crisis narratives of the coronavirus pandemic. Here we go, please bear with me. From a narratological point of view, crises are not really a well-defined concept, they're rather a metaphor, or they could be conceived of as mini narrations. They are kinds of special events, or perhaps even non-events, that mark the turning point at which a decision about the development has to be made. At the same time, however, crisis narratives are molded by cultural scripts, cognitive frames, and historical models. I will intersperse the 10 hypotheses by showing you a book that you might want to read. This is Crisis, unfortunately published in that awful language called German. Number two, crisis narratives can be understood as particular cultural ways of world making to use Nelson Goodman's felicitous formulation and that they are based on processes of selection and deletion, abstraction and distinction, composition and ordering, as well as waiting. They also require particular kinds of narrative configuration and what Hayden White has called emplotment. If you want to know more about this, you might want to look at cultural ways of world making. Three, by creating conceptual blends between the private and personal domain of illness and the public sphere of economics, politics, or international relations, crisis metaphors not only activate certain frames, they also define action roles and project narrative schemata on the situation. Moreover, they profoundly affect the way in which cultural, economic, or political changes, as well as the current health crises, are perceived and understood. In other ways, metaphors shape cultures just as much as cultures shape metaphors. Four, by connecting the past, the present, and the future into a unifying and usually teleological plot, crisis narratives create dramatic scenarios or crisis imaginaries, to use the concept of the title of the con conference, that enable the exploration of possible futures or future trajectories. So describing developments as a crisis always involves interpreting the past in a particular negative way, making, as Janet has just said, diagnoses about the present and deriving from the diagnoses certain therapeutic interventions. A case study would be the financial crises, as you can see in this book, The Cultural Life of Money. I'll get back to Janet's book in a second. Five, in addition to imparting structure and meaning to largely contingent events, crises metaphors and crises narratives fulfill a number of important functions that shape the cultural life of crises and also the possible future scenarios. Metaphors and narratives of crises assert the need of crisis management. They make political arguments. They propagate normative views, and they usually fulfill legitimizing functions. I'll now turn my attention more specifically 
for the competing crises narratives of the coronavirus pandemic. Hypothesis number six. Although the competing crises of the coronavirus pandemic that have emerged since March 2020 usually emphasize the novelty, they unwittingly provide paradigm examples of how metaphors and narratives of crises are shaped by cultural traditions, traditions, while at the same time shaping the ways in which the outbreak of the pandemic is perceived. Focusing on the medical crisis of the coronavirus pandemic, the prevailing accounts offered by epidemiologists and virologists follow the patterns and storyline of a very well-known narrative that Priscilla Wald, in an excellent and fascinating book called Contagious, has called the outbreak narrative. Here it is. If you read one book about the pandemic, read this one. Priscilla Wald, Contagious. Seven, the wide range of competing crisis narratives that have been disseminated about the pandemic fulfill important normative functions because they authorize and propagate ideologically charged diagnoses of a situation they purport merely to describe neutrally. They thus testify to the fact that crisis narratives always highlight certain domains of life, certain standards of normalcy, while marginalizing or occluding other areas and norms. By providing a diagnosis of the present, crisis narratives of the pandemic project particular norms and values onto the target domain of both the pandemic and the contemporary state of affairs. I can only warmly recommend this book, which I consider to be the best book on the topic. The title is hard to see. It's Janet's brilliant book, Anti-Crises. I wish I could quote from it at length, but I don't have the time for it. But Janet has just described the gist of the argument wonderfully. Eight, making visible latent problems and unresolved tensions, the crisis of the pandemic can be understood less as just a health crisis, but rather as a catalyst of a cluster or series of quite different crises. We could also interpret them as a deep crisis with different dimensions and layers. Whether or not we decide to use such labels as deep crises or patchwork pandemic or structural and systemic crises is less important than appreciating that it is by no means clear or self-evident what kind or kinds of crises we're actually dealing with. Moreover, the choice of a label and the kind of diagnosis that will prevail in the long run will ultimately also shape the political decisions, measures and responses, and thus the question which of the various possible futures we will actually get. Nine, when trying to get to grips with various crises that the coronavirus pandemic have precipitated, we do not only need to take into consideration the contagious nature of the disease, but equally the also the contagious nature of narratives that the Nobel laureate Robert Schiller explored in his monograph, Narrative Economics, How Stories Go Viral, written before the pandemic and incredibly readable. The competing crises narratives surrounding the pandemic constitute not just an infodemic, but I completely agree with Janet, they constitute a fully fledged epistemological crisis and also thus a normative crisis, epistemological crisis in the sense as defined by the philosopher Alistair McIntyre. 10 and last, the currently prevailing crisis narratives that focus on the return to normality or rather to what was generally taken to be normal, occlude the fact that such a return to the old normal world would also mean a return to the su suppression of unresolved conflicts, of contradictions and crisis about the pandemic, 
that the bent end actually laid bare in the first place. Such a return is arguably neither possible nor desirable. It would imply only a perpetuation of the master narrative of unlimited growth. And that should have been thoroughly discredited as no longer tenable. So what we would need instead is a complete game change, drawing the right conclusions from the competing narratives of the pandemic in order to meet the challenges of the 21st century. Thank you very much. And here is the last book, unfortunately. Okay, Sorry. thank you very much. The translation of the title would be After the Crises is Before the Catastrophe. I hope this will not obtain, but I'm not too optimistic at present. Thanks very much for bearing you, with me. Thank you very much, uh, Ansgar, uh, for your um, wonderful uh, kind of summary of, of a narratological approaches to crises, which you then tagged on to uh, our current uh, and understanding and narration of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we will come back to all these points in our discussion. But now it's uh, um, Joseph Ford's turn to uh, reimagine crisis for us. Uh, his paper is uh, Reimagining Crisis for Multilingual Community Engagement During COVID-19. So over to you, Joseph. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just going to share some uh, slides. I hope that's okay. And I hope you can see them. So that's my title. Okay, so um, thank you, first of all, thank you very much to Janet and uh, Ansgar, who have just touched on many of the points that I'm going to raise. So you'll see that there, there is a lot of crossover on this panel, which is, which is really great to see. Um, so just to begin really with that point that uh, Ansgar raised about uh, media narratives of the pandemic are portraying this crisis as new, as unexpected, as something we could never have planned for. We actually see, um, and uh, Janet's hinting at this as well, that research shows that the virus reveals and exacerbates pre-existing inequalities and intensifies the effects of poverty, of racism and linguistic exclusion. Um, among already marginalized groups. And indeed, um, most of us have failed, or perhaps uh, many of us, I should say, have failed uh, to imagine crisis as an existing part of many people's daily lives. Are you against this impulse to newness then, um, which I think is characteristic of the media narratives of the pandemic? I ask how translating COVID, uh, the COVID crisis rather, in multiple different languages, might allow us to open up a new epistemic and temporal horizons of crisis and better tune into the different temporalities of hurt and trauma that have been exposed and exacerbated among marginalized communities. So um, that's quite a bold claim for eight to 10 minutes. So I'm just gonna touch on uh, some aspects of my thoughts about this. Um, in its most common definition, as we've heard already um, in the Greek etymology, crisis uh, refers to a moment of intense difficulty or a turning point in time. Um, initially associated with the, the medical context, the meaning of the term uh, crisis um, has expanded to what I'm going to cite uh, Janet's brilliant book here, uh, to what Janet Reutemann calls the omnipresent noun formation of contemporary historical narrative. Uh, for Reutemann, crisis is mobilized in narrative constructions to mark out, or designate moments of truth when decisions are taken or events are decided. Uh, with the effect of establishing a particular teleology and a new historical trajectory into the future. Thus, the dominant definition of crisis frames it as a temporal phenomenon um, that is at once limited in time and exerts profound effects on the future. Uh, like uh, Janet, I'm generally quite sceptical um, of the ways uh, those uh, in power use crisis to shift or establish dominant narratives of history um, or make claims to what is objectively true. And the pandemic has been narrativized as sudden, it's been narrativized as unexpected, um, even if it arguably is not really completely unexpected. And I think this is what Janet is, is getting at. These things do happen every hundred or so years. Many governments have run scenarios for this kind of epidemic. Countries in East Asia 
and the Pacific have long established systems for dealing with viral outbreaks. And yet this supposedly unexpected crisis is being used not just in the UK, but across the globe to designate our current moment as a turning point in history where radical decisions must be taken. So in the UK, uh, for example, this has led to the intensification of um, a kind of mass handover of government money to private firms, such as Serco and G4S, and the removal of usual uh, tendering processes um, that would normally protect against some of the more obvious corrupt practices that I would, I would say appear to be taking place. But for many of us, none of this will be surprising, um, but this narrative of crisis is allowing governments to avoid scrutiny and deploy, um, sorry, scru uh, to avoid scrutiny of deeply ideological plans to change the economic fabric and orientation of the state. So um, while I tell you all of this is true of the, of the narrative of crisis at the, at the government level, it's also true um, that those of us thinking and researching in the academy have appropriated an existing narrative of crisis for our own ends. So on the other end of the spectrum, there are those of us who have turned to existing work in anthropology to frame our own version of crisis as uh, perhaps endemic in marginalized communities. And I think this, on the other hand, at the other, other, uh, other end of the spectrum, um, runs the risk of precasting communities as crisis ridden or foreclosing the variety of everyday experience that we might otherwise find within diverse groups. And this is where I'm getting on to uh, what we're doing here at the IMLR. Um, so we recently submitted a funding bid uh, to uh, work with linguistically minoritized and marginalized communities in London. And we're still uh, uh, waiting to hear the outcome of that bid. But if it does go ahead, then the project will use a series of creative workshops to learn about the impacts of the pandemic in multilingual communities. And uh, this is building on work done by my colleague, uh, Maria Soledad Montañez, who's been working uh, really closely with the Latin American community in Southwark. Um, however, since submitting this bid, I've uh, become a bit conscious that these dual discursive tendencies that I just mentioned, so on the one hand, describing the crisis as temporally new, and on the other, describing it as endemic in marginalized communities, are both guilty of applying a polarizing lens uh, to the reality of the situation we face and particularly um, to the everyday realities of what might be people's everyday experience of crisis. So part of what we'd like to do with our project is um, to create space to capture in a more nuanced way uh, the multiple experiences of crisis as they've been uh, lived and felt by linguistically marginalized uh, groups. So just very quickly in the time that remains, um, I just want to very briefly gesture towards how we might use translation in a productive way to question existing approaches in the research on crisis and to meaningfully engage with communities living in our city, around the university, and in our case that's communities um, who don't have English as a first language. Ultimately I, I want to stress how the, the critical moment, what Rebecca Bryant refers to as the critical threshold, um, can be a place of learning um, where researchers listen uh, listen to and learn from communities, allowing for a more self-reflexive stance when it comes to defining the term crisis. Mm -hmm. So two questions that I'm wanting to ask as part of the planning process for these workshops, and obviously I'd very, because this is very much in the planning process, so I'd, I'd welcome any feedback that people have on this. Um, two questions. So the first is how can an exploration of crisis in all its different cultural and linguistic guises empower communities to have critical agency in defining their present and developing their own futures. And crucially, uh, for me, this is a crucial question, how thinkable is this critical agency at the level of multilingual communities here in the UK? So the project we're looking at is, is just focused on the UK for the time being. And what, what I mean by this is how conscious are we of the work multilingual communities already do and have been doing during uh, the pandemic? Um, whether that's translating key public health information, uh, distributing that in a, in a trusted uh, forum, using translators uh, in the community, in medical context, for example, running language classes, running uh, language exchanges. For central government and many local authorities, language, uh, language remains an ideological blind spot 
um, that continues to render multilingualism uh, and the kinds of work multilingual people do unthinkable. And we can see this in the lack of consultation and the absence of an active role for communities uh, in the supposedly, uh, in feeding into this supposedly objective narrative of crisis, uh, this normative narrative of crisis developed in government. In his work on Haiti, uh, Greg Beckett uh, shifts the standard definition of crisis from this objective historical or political rupture towards an understanding of crisis as a category of human experience. And he does this precisely by focusing on language and translation. Uh, in Haitian Creole, the term for crisis is uh, crise, um, whose common meaning is very close to the French crise, um, referring to an attack or fit in, in the medical sense. And Beckett goes on to explain uh, how uh, in Haitian Creole, the term crisis is linked to an unmediated bodily response to trauma a sudden interruption of the functioning of one's body and mind. He writes how, while in English, the temporality of crisis has become its key feature, so the turning point or the time of intense difficulty, the French and Creole terms render crisis as an embodied condition that is rooted in the social and psychological experience of an individual. And this just leads me to uh, a couple of final questions. How can a process of epistemological and linguistic reflection help us interrogate the effects of normative definitions of crisis that we've been hearing about um, and the effects of those definitions on marginalized communities in particular. Indeed, is a linguistic reflection a prerequisite to a genuinely epistemological one? And how can we cede power to multilingual communities so that they too can have a critical voice in the discussion about how we define crisis. In my view, uh, being with and establishing a practice of listening and learning from communities has to be a part of what we do as a discipline of, of languages and perhaps the humanities more broadly. Uh, being with and learning from the communities around us is part of a process of strengthening um, the discipline of languages, the disciplines of languages and the humanities that I think are already very well placed to challenge those who continue to offer um, the kinds of normative, monolingual, culturally reductive definitions of crisis that we've been uh, referring to today. I'll stop there, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> Joseph, could you disable your, your um, PowerPoint? Thank you very much. Uh, for your paper that um, obviously reflects um, uh, also the IMLR uh, interest in, in modern languages and, and multilingualism as, a, as, a, as an additional perspective on, on our exploration. So we have now a good half an hour uh, for a discussion. And I'm not going to uh, attempt to synthesize what has been said, but let me just um, perhaps summarize a few points that have been made. The first one is that crisis is an object of knowledge. Um, the second one is perhaps that uh, crisis is the placeholder for contingency, historical contingency. That's, I think, a very interesting point that perhaps we could uh, pick up. The third point is that it is a speech act which mobilizes in a particular way. And the fourth point that I took from your papers is that it is a mode of narration, a mode of narration that um, emphasizes tipping points, turning points in a dramatic manner. And this also leads us to the temporality of crisis, that crisis as we understand it, and this does not coincide with the Greek notion of krinon, that crisis in the modern uh, 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 terms are eruptive. They are eruptive. They 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 appear. They tend. They appear to appear suddenly, even though they have a latency period, uh, as we have just heard. And then uh, the other um, uh, point that that came to mind when Joseph was speaking is that the normative effects of this kind of type of crisis intervention and crisis narration disguises substantial differences and needs at community level ranging from 
linguistic needs to you know differences in race in in income in gender in uh, ability etc cetera, etc cetera. so it, it creates a normative framework that disguises uh, extremely important um, um, uh, factors uh, uh, that should be taken into account when we speak of crisis management. So I, I leave it at this attempt to synthesize some of the points, and I'm going to hand it over to the audience and to you, the other panelists. So can I invite observations and interventions, please? Uh, hi, um, I don't know if you can hear me. I'm going to observe that um, this work on crisis is fascinating. Um, within it, I'm interested actually that no one is really um, defining or qualifying or critiquing, critiquing the term imaginaries. So imaginaries is used here as if it's taken as read that we all understand that defined as a metaphor, a narrative, stories that are told predominantly by the hegemonic discourse or the media. Uh, and it's interesting particularly to hear from Joseph about the importance of listening to another voice. So not the voice of the hegemonic uh, media, not the voice of the state, not the voice of power, but another voice. And that, um, in this case, the voice of marginalized communities. I just wonder if there's anything to say about, even before we get back to the idea of crisis. Is there anything to say here about the imaginary, uh, any problematizing of the imaginary? Uh, and just to end with a very quick quotation, there's a quotation from Strauss in her work on the imaginary, saying the primary question to ask here is, whose imaginaries are these? Because we seem to sometimes risk talking about an imaginary as if there is just one simple monolithic imaginary going on, uh, which defines terms like crisis. Uh, and I'm particularly intrigued okay. as to Joseph's reaction to that. Yeah. Okay, Joseph, can I, can I hand this back to you, please? Of course, thank you very much for the question. And um, yeah, I mean, when you were talking there, that was kind of precisely, that was, uh, I suppose, precisely where I'm coming from in terms of the paper. It's thinking about that question, although I haven't picked up on it in my paper, the question of the imaginary uh, whose imaginary are we talking about? Whose perspective are we talking about? And is it useful to think a little bit more? Um, well, I mean, certainly, we've, as we've heard from everyone, you know, we want to get away from these normative definitions of crisis. But to what extent um, can that be part of a work we, um, the, the work we do in our disciplines? And I think that's one aspect of the paper that I tried to move the discussion a little bit towards the discipline of languages and the discipline of the humanities and thinking about what kind of uh, work we should be doing at times like this um, or what kind of work perhaps we should be doing anyway in our disciplines. Is, is this moment of crisis a moment for us to reflect on the imaginary? <laughs> is it, is it, is it a, a reminder of, a, of the kinds of work we should already be doing uh, with different communities? Um, uh, anyway, yeah, that's how. So maybe I can ask the other um, contributors, Ansgar and and Janet, to respond. I mean, I'm not so sure that I would agree with the idea of completely moving away from the normative dimension of crises. So when you have a situation as in the United States, where the crisis management this time has been absolutely disastrous, with high death tolls and um, you know a poor poor response to the crisis. Clearly, it shows that um, crises are not just narrative constructions. So I'm handing it back to uh, um, Janet and Ansgar. Janet, you raised your hand, and then Ansgar, perhaps. Yeah, sure. I, maybe I'm sort of the a bit of an outlier here because, you know, I'm an anthropologist. <laughs> so we're always listening to people. Right? That's like what we do. Um, I, I guess the question, though, is, um, and I, I mean, this is a provocation, so please no one take offense. I just, I don't know what a non-normative definition of anything is, right? And that, that's an anthropological view. I mean, if I go somewhere in any, I go to five different place, far-flung places in the world, far-flung from each other, 
you know, there are different normative regimes and different, you know, uh, ways of valuing, you know, aspects of life. And so, so I guess that's my point. I, I, I think that um, the way I got to this work on the concept of crisis as an object of knowledge, you know, as Anne said, um, it was through prior work that I had done in the early 90s with Ashil Mbembe. And we specifically, we were in uh, living in Africa and we were interested in, I think this refers back to the, um, the question that has been asked, uh, was that we were really struck by the ways that people who were not in positions of power were taking up the World Bank language of crisis, right? And it had become a figure of rationality for them, a way of kind of explaining and apprehending their world. So we, but we looked into it. I mean, that became our, our object of research, right? The ways that they were doing that and the consequences, right? I then later though, kind of disagreed with us, <laughs> disagreed with myself and, and, and Ashil, because uh, the idea of crisis being a 20 year protracted experience kind of undermines the concept of crisis itself, right? I mean, is it like just a condition that we're living in over decades? And you know, well, is the Anthropocene just one big experience of crisis? So, I mean, I could say a lot about that. I don't want to monopolize the conversation, but it's a, it's a, it's a really important point. Thank you. Yeah, Ansgar, can I ask you to come, yeah. come in on this? Thank you very much. I think you're raised to very important and interesting questions. I'd like to get back to the imaginary. Well, I try to, well, I couldn't explain it obviously, uh, but the, the, the very metaphor of crises already contains uh, a kind of kernel imaginary. Uh, it defines certain action roles. It defines an overarching narrative. You have a patient. Uh, you have the doctor who is in charge. Uh, and this is a very, very specific imaginary. And then it depends, of course, whether we are talking about the current health crises, where it's not just a medical metaphor, but also medical reality, or whether we apply the term to the financial crises, where the roles are allotted to very different uh, stakeholders. Uh, but, but I think the, the first step, uh, uh, what is important to realize is that the metaphor already uh, entails a fully fledged imaginary, uh, and it's then used in very dramatic and ideological ways. Uh, and this is what I try to capture by talking briefly about the functions. Uh, whenever you talk about a crisis, it seems to legitimate uh, whatever kind of action you propose. So if you say this is a desperate crisis, you get the bailouts for the big banks because they are too big to fail. And as Janet, well, I think she does a wonderful job in her book to denaturalize this notion of crises. It's not an objective state of affairs, but as she just explained again in her broad it's a truth claim. Uh, and it's a truth claim which is open to debate. And I wish we could elaborate on this debate. Uh, and I'd like to encourage more, particularly younger researchers to join in from wherever you are. This is a very strange experience, talking into a computer, knowing that 250 or more wonderful young people are listening, not having a clue who they are. So do join in and raise more questions. Yes, can I ask for more questions from the audience, please, or the other panelists? Um, if you want to raise a question, you can either use the chat function or switch on your mic. I would like to um, ask Joe a question, um, because um, I think what you touched on there is, is going a little bit beyond what we are, uh, what we are possibly all agreed on. If we're all thinking uh, uh, of crisis as a moment that enables action, that, that incites us to action, um, and uh, uh, yeah, uh, and to think about power structures and to, to, you know, that encapsulates some kind of idea of hope and future. Then the, um, the definition that you just uh, gave us, the, the definition of the Creole, the uh, crease, that seems to go counter to that. Because uh, if, you're, if you're talking about crisis or crease as, as a kind of bodily reaction, as a trauma, then isn't that rather paralyzing? Isn't that 
you know, isn't that going against what we are thinking, uh, uh, we are, we, what we imagine uh, that the crisis could possibly do as a positive? As a, you know, um, so I think it's even more important in, in that respect to bring in other voices because not only because they have different experiences and because they have different, because actually there might be imaginaries that come, you know, almost sort of across purposes to, to, to how we are thinking about it. What, what do you think to, about that, Joe? Yes, thank you, Paula. Thank you for your question. Um, I, I agree. I think that's precisely um, the idea with these workshops is to, I mean, I just, just to come back on the question of if, if there are, I, I, I'm, I'm, tempt, I, I'm, I'm tempted to agree with Janet that, that you, know, you can't get away from, you know, normative uh, narrative or normat normativity in that sense. And I think, I suppose, we're just wanting to hear alternative narratives in a way rather than non-normative narratives. And I think that's something um, uh, that uh, 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 the research would hopefully achieve. We would hope it would achieve that. Just to come back to the question of trauma, um, I think uh, for, for, for Beckett, this is a, a starting point rather than an end point. So I wouldn't want to uh, think of this in necessarily negative terms. Um, this is a starting point for ex uh, exploration, for uh, working through, I suppose you could use that term, working through trauma. Um, and um, but I but I do take your point about about th th there's a contradiction there. And I I've been a bit conflicted about the term crisis really and using the term crisis and whether that would be an appropriate term to use in um, a workshop with um, members of the community who uh, may be uh, suffering or who clearly are suffering in various different ways from, um, from the impacts of the virus. So I, yeah, there is a contradiction there and I think it reflects my own uncertainty about using that term crisis. Um, but uh, yeah, to come back to the trauma, I see it as a starting point rather than something that is a negative uh, place to kind of end the conversation. Sorry, thank you. So we have a few uh, interesting questions in the in the chat. Gorilla, uh, um, uh, can you take Enrica's and perhaps Jean Rio's, uh, Enrica Ferrara's and Jean Rio's questions? Okay, so Enrica is asking, I wonder if our conceptualization, conceptualization of crisis is a bit too human centric. And also our attempt to understand and solve the crisis seems to be linked to our ability to dominate language. Instead, the agency of the non-human seemed to be very important to interpret the current crisis, both the health and the environmental one. I would like to know what the three panelists think about this observation. Thank you. Yeah, so I'm handing it back. So the post-humanist perspective on this debate, how does that challenge our own understanding of, of crisis narrations and the episteme crisis? So I'll hand it back, whoever wants to start first. I, I guess I can because I'm always asked this question. So thank you for the question. It's a really good one, right? I mean, it's like, what about environmental crisis or, uh, yeah, or just non non uh, human perspective? Um, you know, I guess the one of the things when I was working on my project, and this is a few years ago already, but uh, is that you know there's this old philosophical thing of like if a tree falls in a forest, and I haven't observed it, did a tree fall? Right, this is like this old philosophical problem, right? But which I'm not going to get into. But, but, but I did ask my question: like, trees were falling and fires were burning in many forests for however long now, and over the past decades, and that was not taken to be a sign of global warming, right? So they, they were perhaps seen as signs of impending like environmental crisis by some groups, right? Like Greenpeace, or certainly by indigenous communities. But this gets back to this question about like, this is really what I'm interested in. It's like the power differentials and it's Ansgar, Ansgar's point about narrativity. So even though indigenous communities knew or perhaps observed and uh, the tree falling and the fire starting to burn and didn't name it global warming, but saw it as problematic, that was not inscribed in the annals of history. In the 1950s, no one was saying environmental crisis, even though those indigenous populations 
might have ha been able to narrate a problem. So I'm not giving you the non-human perspective. That's just not what my work does. But I have that. I think that's a really good example of how the claim to crisis is a political claim. And um, and so and I, the with respect to the finance, what I really I, I don't know how this works with COVID-19, but with with respect to finance, there was one day when the Wall Street Journal and the Financial Times and the Treasury secretaries of all the countries and the central bank. You know, heads of the central banks of all the countries said, yes, let's go to press in big font like this big and say financial crisis in the banks back in 2007. Like that's a decision that is taken. Houses, the, those markets were always undercapitalized. There was never enough money. So like it's, you really have to think about these in terms of like, as, and I think as Ansgar was saying, like there's processes of selection and you know, that it's not just an, a natural phenomenon. And so I'm, I'm giving a long-winded answer to your question, but I think that when a tree falls and who observes it and who gets to narrate it is maybe one way to think about this. Just to add a couple of footnotes to what Janet said, I'm in complete agreement with what you said, uh, but I also think your point is well taken. Uh, the whole all the competing narratives of the pandemic, they've been far too human-centered. And the best interventions that I've seen are by Jane Goodall. Taking animals' points of views would really be helpful. Uh, taking the non-human world uh, as the focus, this would also remind us uh, that the health crisis is certainly important. But uh, if we don't do something about the climate catastrophe soon and fast. This is, in the long run, far more dangerous and far more important. But I think with the focus uh, that the organizers have chosen on theorizing crises, imaginaries, this is uh, three foci uh, determined by a human perspective. It's humans who do the theorizing, it's humans who define what a crisis is, and it's humans who project imaginaries. So I think this is largely uh, predetermined by the topic, but not by what is at stake in the real world. What is at stake in the real world is threats to animals, to the natural environment. This is in the long run far more critical and threatening uh, for all of us uh, than whatever happens as far as the pandemic is concerned. So thanks very much for great. bringing this important perspective uh, into our debate. That's great. And I'd like to um, take up Jean Rio's point, but maybe Jean, if you're there, you can unmute yourself and ask it yourself. Okay, <laughs> I'll try, I'll do my best. It's disappeared from my screen now, but I think um, what, um, what I wanted to um, ask Janet is, is in relation to um, crisis as an object of knowledge and an epistemological claim, as, as Ansgar put it, a truth claim, um, whether the mobilization of such uh, of, of, of this, these truth claims, this object of knowledge, then makes it, makes it all the easier to mask um, an intention to, uh, to not intervene in any way and mask an intention to um, allow underlying conditions to um, continue to prevail no matter, no matter what they are and use the discourse of crisis to, um, to permit, um, I suppose, um, failure to address um, uh, problems of, for example, widely divergent um, health healthcare infrastructures that, ne that necessitate um, removal of um, of civil liberties and closures of closures of borders in the current um, in the current situation where it becomes extremely difficult then to have any kind of of, of uh, debate at all about about removing uh, about the removal of civil liberties without um, inadvertently be falling into the camp of the deniers and the uh, and so on. So it, 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 it's, um, it's a really difficult time in that respect. And I, I wonder, um, I suppose, would you, would you agree that this sort of crisis is too easily mobilized? Is, is this your point that it's, it's too easily mobilized to do nothing except um, some emergency measures that mask the underlying inequality? <laughs> <laughs> 
Sorry, my mute button was being funny. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. Nice to meet you. Thank you for the question. Um, I think about this all the time. <laughs> so I am looking out my window onto Ninth Avenue where there is a food pantry line, which you would it wraps around the whole block. And there's another one on that street. I mean, I, I, I think it's very hard to, for people to imagine what New York is like right now. Um, and don't forget, we've been through months of, of social protests around race and police killings are still happening. And, you know, so, so on one, on the one hand, my short answer to is yes. <laughs> and I can like remute, I guess, but, but the more seriously, like, I think this really is an urgent question for study. I mean, I think, you know, sort of all my colleagues all over New York city should, or all over this country perhaps should, should be studying this precisely this question. Um, I don't think that it's a conspiracy, to be honest. I just don't have proof for that, right? So I don't think it's like an intentional, we're gonna use the crisis. You know, I'm sure there's some people who have those kinds of thoughts sitting in some halls of power uh, somewhere here, certainly in this country right now. Um, but I do think that the, the COVID-19, you know, justified interventions by the Federal Reserve and they pumped credit and they pumped liquidity, right, into the financial system. They basically bought corporate bonds and held up the price level, the prices of, of assets. So I'm not gonna get into that. I've written about that actually, if you're interested, but, but so the money went into equity, it went into the stock market. This is why the stock market is soaring. And, and we have these food pantry lines all over the place. And the, the national, yesterday on television, the National Association of Restaurants and whatever said 60 to 80% of the restaurants across the nation will close if there isn't any help. And don't forget, that means all the people who are washing and supplying linens and all the people who are prepping food and growing vegetables and all that, I don't need to tell you all this. So it's, it's really is a, it is a big question, but this, this kind of baseline of extreme inequality in the United States is taken as a norm. That was really the point that I was making in my opening remarks. And I think that if this were, if the, if this was, if this were a full epistemological crisis, Right in the fullest sense of the term that you know we use in social theory and in philosophy, you know we we would be addressing these these kind of underlying or these underlying norms would be um, transformed or displaced or something. Right, but uh, right now there is a lot of insecurity and it doesn't seem to be troubling much of anybody. Mm -hmm. So at least here, and this is maybe different in in different parts of Europe for certain. Thank you very much, uh, Janet. And I'd like to take another question because we, the chat function is very active. So if Simon Philpot is here, could you, could you ask your own question rather than me reading it out? Simon, are you here? No? Yes, I am here. Oh, oh. right, super. So hey. could you ask your own question about uh, crisis and violence, please? I will. I'm just gonna read it out in the interest of keeping it short, otherwise I'll just sort of waffle. Um, to what extent is the concept of crisis necessarily, necessarily bound to violence? Is the declaration of a crisis to engage in some form of violent engagement with those that are framed in and by crisis? If, as Joseph suggests, many live with crisis as part of everyday life, is that another way of saying people are constantly negotiating violence? Thank you very much for that question. It's a very important question, the relationship of a crisis discourse or crises as a phenomenon and violence. I'll hand it off. Joseph, maybe would you like to uh, start? Yeah, sure. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Simon, for your question. I, um, when, you, when you were speaking there, it made me think uh, when I was writing the paper and I, I had the uh, temptation to go to Rob Nixon's slow violence and to, and to look at that text because it struck, it struck me that that concept is very similar to what I'm talking about in terms of um, the extended crisis or uh, this question of you know, the everyday crises that people are living. And perhaps that is a better way to theorize it than to talk about crisis. And I think uh, that's all I'll say on that for now, if that's all right, thank you. Okay, do, do, uh, Janet or Ansgar, do you want to um, elaborate on crisis, the relationship of crisis and violence? If not, I will uh, take another uh, uh, question. Or Gorilla, will you take another question? You've been looking at the chat function as well. 
Yep, uh, I'd be very happy to, to um, pick up the question from um, from Jessica, Stacy. Do, do you want to pick up? Yeah, but do you want to ask your own question, Jessica? Yeah, sure. Sorry, night has fallen while well, this wonderful event has been happening. So sorry if I'm kind of looming in the dark a bit. Um, I guess I guess you've asked me to go next because I, in my question, also like was responding to Simon and saying I was also thinking yeah. about uh, slow violence. Um, and so if anyone wants to say a bit more about that, great. If not, I can just read what I've put down, which is like the lurch from crisis to crisis in the media cycle seems deeply presentist. Um, and I wonder if like the turning point potential of crisis narratives has, has, has sort of been lost as crises become so compressed and follow on from each other so quickly. And yeah, how can we use the concept of slow or the, the slow or the unspectacular to explore what these crises actually do or do not change for particular groups? And I'll just throw in a little extra bit as well, which is like, it sounds like quite different to the experience you're having, Janet, but in the UK, it feels like this crisis is quite slow and unspectacular. And some like slightly good news that we've had recently is that social attitudes seem to have softened massively over the course of this year, like social attitudes to deprivation and to people's vulnerabilities to falling into their own personal crises. Because I think a lot more people have been exposed to their neighbors, their friends, their family, kind of falling into these crises, falling into precarity. So I wonder if this particular crisis represents some form of opportunity to explore the slow and the unspectacular. Thank you. Um, can I ask you to, to respond? Yeah, Ansgar. Sorry, I just had to pick up two more books. Um, thank you very much for what I think is one of the crucial issues. Uh, crises, on the one hand, always alerts us to something incredibly dramatic. Uh, and I think at the moment, the pandemic is played off against the very slow but much more, as I've said before, in the long run, important crises uh, concerning the environment, the climate, and so on. And I think also in the academy, uh, we have accepted a culture of speed. And the books I wanted to pick up, something I would really recommend to all of you, The Slow Professor Challenging the Culture of Speed in the Academy, written by two colleagues from Canada, Maggie Burke and Barbara Sieber. Uh, and I think we should all really rethink the way uh, we accept this culture of speed and acceleration, or whether we need to slow down, both as far as our own practice is concerned and about thinking uh, about the topic at hand, that is, how do crises operate? The term signifies dramatic turning points but I think what we're actually dealing with in the social realm, uh, we've had social inequality for far longer than any one of us cares to remember. And I think, and this is the other book, Slow Philosophy by Michelle Boulos Walker might be a way uh, of doing, well, encourage us to do this rethinking uh, and no longer accept this culture of speed, uh, but really rethink the way that we operate in the academy as well. Uh, and I think in order to get our head around what's happening at the moment, what Janet and I have been calling uh, fully fledged epistemological crises, we all need to do a lot of rethinking and not buying into uh, the crisis discourses that we have heard over the last 10 months. I don't think they will be the answer to any of the serious 21st century challenges. So thanks for bringing slowness into the debate. Okay, would um, Joseph or Janet like to uh, pick, pick up this point or, or not? Yes? Uh, yeah, just, just to, to confirm what Ansgar just said really, but uh, um, yeah, as to welcome slowness. I mean, you know, part of the thing about like the emergence of the virus, and this is the point I was making in re with reference to Andy Lakoff's work on preparedness, um, which is really, you know, he wrote a book called Unprepared <laughs> a while ago. And is really, you know, this whole biosecurity apparatus was put in place. And part of this slow transformation, the reason we're having all these, these more and more viral uh, incidents and, and pandemics is partly because of what we're doing, deforestation. I mean, it's an ecological question that's underlying a lot of this, not all of it, right? But a lot of it. 
So that is slow transformation that we can be documenting and researching and responding to, right? And as opposed to this kind of, you know, narrow, you know, like I guess the point I really want to make is, is this is the point I was trying to make about when, when the tree falls. I mean, what gets, what gets to be inscribed in the annals of history? Right, so the slow deforestation. I mean, I've lived in Africa a lot. The slow deforestation there, and you know, across the um, Pacific, you know, is long-standing. And then we have Ebola. We have something, you know, a viral infection that affects humans, and we scream crisis. But we, we're not documenting that slow. Some of us are, but that slow historical transformation. This is Rob Nixon's point, right, or part of his point. So I guess I, there's a prior question about like what gets to count as an event in the first place, right? I mean, who, who's gonna read your boring book about some slow thing happening, right? And I, I, I say that jokingly, but I, but I actually mean it because I more and more am sort of pushing graduate students, you know, to do different kinds of research. And it's really hard because the funding agencies want to hear global health crisis. They want to hear violence, you know, they, that's what they wanna fund. So it's very hard to kind of shift. My work is now on this, hopefully very boring process of the growth of the middle class in Africa. You know, that sounds very boring. To be honest, it could be the biggest change on the continent since colonization. Mm -hmm. But we're sort of ignoring it because it's not, it doesn't have that, you know, event kind of, you know, catastrophic, you know, um, clamor to it. So, Yeah, Reinhard Koselik has written about the event um, in terms of the temporality of modern history and how we frame events uh, of course, uh, uh, in this regard. But uh, Joseph, would you like to uh, co come back in on this before we take a break for bef before the next panel or? Just to reiterate what the panelists have said, really, um, I think clearly there is an institutional <laughs> question of the kinds of slow work that we're permitted to do. But just to comment on our own, the process of applying for you know, a bid, it, it's, it's ironic because the, the, the process has been slowed down, not, 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 not because of us, we, we put it together very quickly, but because of the funding council being very slow to respond. Um, but, you know, I think um, slowness, I, I don't think these kinds of um, short term funding bids are necessarily the best way to do things, even though we have applied for one. And I think I would definitely like to, you know, take the opportunity to uh, take more time to write these kinds of bits and uh, to think more deeply about the kinds of concepts mm. that we that we use. So, yeah, that's just to, to add and kind of reiterate with what, what, what people have already said. I posted a link to a blog by Laura Wright in the... Um, in the chat, which is fantastic and uh, asks a lot of answers or poses a lot of questions about the link between the emergence of the virus and um, the ongoing ecological uh, catastrophe. And it's particularly around that question of how the virus emerged from animals. So just, just and, and the interaction of humans with animals. So I just fact, wanted to post that in the chat. Both crises are interdependent. Without an ecological crisis, we wouldn't have, you know, coronavirus and all these 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 um, viral infections, of course. So there is a connection which is disguised in the current uh, discourse. Okay, um, looking at the chat function, there are many, many questions about the temporality of crisis. And that's, uh, I think, going to be a, a theme uh, of the second panel. So we are now going to take a 15 minutes break. Is that correct? Am I right, Gordela, 15 minutes? So we're gonna reconvene at, um, Five, well, five, so in 15 minutes, wherever you are, you're going to reconvene in 15 minutes. Uh, so please stay, don't uh, turn off, don't leave the meeting. You can turn off your cameras if you wish, but, st but stay in the meeting. So I want to thank uh, the panelists for a fantastic first panel. And I also want to thank the audience for your brilliant questions. It's been a great start to uh, our crisis webinar. So see you in 15 minutes and thank you very much. <clears throat> thank you very much for coming back um, so punctually uh, from the break. Um, so I'll follow the, uh, the structure um, uh, that we've been following so far. I'll introduce the speakers briefly.
and then we'll have the, uh, uh, the brief talks following each other. Um, so our first speaker in this second panel is uh, Sarah Churchwell. She's Professor in American Literature and Chair of Public Understanding of the Humanities at the School of Advanced Study, uh, University of London. She's been named the, um, uh, one of the world's top 50 thinkers in 2019 by Prospect Magazine. And she contributes regularly to journals and newspapers such as the New York Review of Books, The Guardian, The Times Literary Supplement. Um, Sarah has also published uh, a book very recently uh, this year uh, entitled Behold America, a History of America First and the American Dream. Uh, Anna Fuchs, uh, whom you've all met <laughs> by now, is going to be our first speaker, uh, our second speaker. And Anna is Professor of German Literature and Culture. She's also the Director of the Humanities Institute at University College, uh, College Dublin. Uh, she is a member of the Royal Irish Academy and a fellow of the British Academy. And she's published widely on German cultural memory, modernist literature, and on contemporary German literature. Her most recent monograph uh, appeared last year uh, and uh, was entitled Precarious Times, Temporality and History in Modern German Culture. Our third speaker in this panel is Marek Tum. Uh, he's Professor of Cultural History at Tallinn University in Estonia. He's also head of Tallinn University Center of Excellence in Intercultural Studies. And his research focuses on European cultural history of medieval Europe, but also on historiography, so the study of historiography, and cultural memory studies. Uh, and among, I'll just name one of his recent publications, uh, he co-edited uh, a volume entitled Rethinking Historical Time, New Approaches to Presentism. Um, so we will start straight away with um, Sarah, and Sarah is going to speak about the American Brown Scare, 1936 to 46. Thank you, Godela, and uh, and thank you, and Anne, for the um, invitation to speak here today. I feel a little bit like um, the odd woman out. Uh, I'm not really a theorist by um, by practice, um, although I went to grad school in the '90s, so uh, you know I had to encounter it. Um, but um, I. Um, I also found, as I was listening to um, the wonderful first panel, that the that the uh, questions and, and conclusions that I had rather laboriously drawn um, were basically your premises. So I think I'm only going to bring us back to where we began. Um, I don't know that I'll progress the argument, but hopefully um, uh, give us some ways of thinking about it. I'm also not going to um, focus quite as tightly on the brown scare as such. I'm just going to use it as one example because I realized as I was writing this that the that the pressures of what's happening right now um, in the United States. And really what I wanted to do was use the Brown Scare as a case study for thinking about it, but with the way the timing in the election has worked out. Um, so I've slightly uh, uh, reworked that, but hopefully it will have some food for thought. Um, I, as a literary historian first and a cultural historian by extension, I tend to begin with uh, definitions. And um, I was sort of operating from a lower threshold for what uh, it takes to constitute a crisis, um, using it more idiomatically and constitutively, um, just thinking about it as in terms of a dictionary definition as an intense uh, turning point. So, um, or as the OED says, a vitally important or decisive stage um, in the progress of anything, a affairs in which a decisive change for better or worse is imminent. And of course, the better or worse there is crucial and is gonna be crucial to what I want to talk about. Um, now applied especially to times of difficulty, insecurity and suspense in politics or commerce. Um, and it's from the Greek uh, crisis, uh, as we've said, to decide. So um, that sense of a decision being made. Um, the big question for anybody following the American political situation right now, um, and certainly the one that is dominating my social media feeds, for example, is um, did the Trump administration just precipitate a legitimate and acute political crisis over authoritarianism and indeed over fascism? Or does Biden's win demonstrate that there was no crisis and that we had what historians might one day soon call a second fascist scare? Did we have a scare? or did we have an acute crisis? Um, 
Now, as I say, um, you know, I'm watching uh, um, certainly, you know, Twitter and other places, uh, um, journalists, commentators, pundits uh, coming out and saying, and I mean, in the last 24 hours since um, Biden was officially uh, named president-elect, um, that the that those of us who've been warning that the authoritarian tactics of the Trump administration, including his refusal to po promise a peaceful transition for the first time in American history, even during during the campaign, not just um, since the election, the private military force that his conciliary uh, AG Barr brought into the nation's capital and into key democratic cities, and then the refusal of the Republican Party as well as the Trump administration to concede that they had in fact lost a free and fair election, um, and that that is still a point that uh, some 70 million Americans are refusing to concede. The question is, is that a legitimate political crisis or now that it's been averted, does it turn out that that was all um, a tempest in a teapot or indeed a scare? I've been thinking for a while about how we narrativize crisis averted. Um, how do we reclaim the contingent from the foregone conclusions of retrospection? Um, or as I tend to frame it in uh, kind of uh, a more idiomatic terms, um, how do we resist the idea that just because something didn't happen, it couldn't have happened? Um, which does, I think, creep into the historiography of crisis a lot. Um, the presentism that Jessica mentioned in the questions is central to my thinking about this, the way in which historical contingency gets rewritten as presentist inevitability. And that tendency toward foregone inevitability seems itself to be, if not actually inevitable, then certainly an acute psychosocial pressure to find that inevitability. That I think inevitability is part of the normalizing process that Janet and others were talking about in that, um, in our first session. What's been interesting, well, one of the many things that's been interesting to me about watching what's happening right now is that we can see the way in which it seems to exert itself in real time. Um, that from my perspective, at least, I can see a clear collective and unconscious pressure being expressed to rewrite the contingency of the last few weeks as inevitability. So that as if we all always knew even three weeks ago that Biden was going to win and it was all going to be fine. Um, that deep uncertainty, which we can evidence and we all presumably actually remember, has already been overwritten by loud claims of uh, this historic inevitability, and that is a way of eliminating a discourse of crisis, it seems to me. Specifically, I think that's what it's working to eliminate. It's there to extirpate in the imaginary, to go back to that point, the possibility of disaster. So instead of disaster averted, or rather what we might call crisis successfully negotiated, which could be another uh, um, psychologically successful way of, uh, of if not normalizing, then of finding, um, uh, restabilizing one's psychological paradigms to say, okay, we, we successfully negotiated crisis. Instead, we seem to, to reveal this pressure to insist that there was no impending disaster at all. Instead of a good decision having been made at this point of intense uh, um, choice, um, there was in fact, it is rewritten as there having been no choice at all. Now, if we think about the history of political crises just in the 20th century in America, we, we are spoiled for choice. We have a plethora of options. Uh, there's Watergate, Vietnam, the assassinations of the 1960s, civil rights, um, the economic crisis of the Great Depression, the mass shootings of today, the public health crisis of today, as we've been saying. Um, one of the big and obvious ones, certainly that would have been um, very prominent in any discussion through the 1980s was the Red Scare and the way that it converged with the Cold War uh, discourse um, in the 1950s. That Red Scare itself, which is often referred to as the Red Scare, was of course actually the second Red Scare um, in America uh, in the 20th century. The first Red Scare followed the First World War, just as the second followed the second. Um, and uh, followed the Bolshevik Revolution, converging with anti-immigrationist xenophobia and anti-Semitism, um, as well as the increasing power of free market capitalism as a political and ideological rather than economic or instrumental force in American political discourse. And that uh, first Red Scare resulted in uh, 1919 in the Palmer Raids and other authoritarian draconian assaults on civil, civil liberties. The ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union, was created in 1920 as a direct result of the Palmer Raids and has been instrumental in fighting back against the executive overreach and misprision, in my view, of the Trump 
But between those two red scares was a, for, a forgotten scare, um, which was the uh, brown, so-called brown scare of the 1930s. During the 1930s, the United States formed at least a dozen colored shirt groups um, that nobody has ever heard of anymore. Um, we had black shirts, the white shirts and Gentile League. We had the khaki shirts, the gray shirts, the silver shirts, uh, the dress shirts, the black legion. There were crusaders for economic liberty who were also shirts. We had all of these shirt organizations as they were known at the time. And they were just perhaps the, the um, easiest to shorthand of over a hundred American organizations that were identified at the time as fascist by the ACLU in the early 1930s. Many of them were formed by former uh, leaders of the Ku Klux Klan who explained loudly at the time that Hitler had learned everything he knew from the Klan and from American race laws. And of course, historiography would later prove that that was indeed true, that Hitler had modeled himself on American race laws. Point is they saw it at the time and the uh, white supremacist fascist movements in America in the 1930s claimed credit for Hitler, um, not the other way around. Um, when these forces, uh, when these groups joined forces around 1940 and 1941 with the so-called America First Committee to urge that the United States should stay out of the Second World War, they were then um, accused once America entered the war by the Roosevelt administration of uh, sedition, of being involved in a vast conspiracy to instill fascism in the United States. And the Roosevelt administration made the decision in 1944 to um, bring them to trial in what became known as the Great Sedition Trial, probably the most farcical large trial in United States history. It was deeply ill-conceived. They got, all, it was legally totally flimsy. But part of the problem, in my view, is that what happened in that uh, trial was the um, conflation of fascism with conspiracy. So what the government didn't do, what they couldn't demonstrate conspiracy, and that was then taken to prove that they were not actually fascist. They were clearly fascist, they just weren't conspiring, right? All of that, uh, which is a long and complex story, um, was forgotten after the Second World War um, laid the groundwork for the, um, the triumph, the inevitability of the triumph of democracy um, and what would then become the Red Scare and the Cold War. So all of that overwrote the possibility of this Brown Scare until in 1983, and don't worry, I'm just wrapping up, but in 1983, um, a historian called Leo Rabufo reclaimed this history and wrote uh, a really influential book um, uh, in which he coined the phrase, the Brown Scare to describe both this uh, a fascist movement in the 1930s and FDR's uh, sedition trial, um, United States versus McWilliams in 1944. Rabufo said that Roosevelt had exaggerated the threat of fascism for political purposes and in so doing weakened American civil liberties and, and laid the groundwork for the Red Scare that followed. So in some for Rabufo, the Red Scare mattered, but the Brown Scare was, um, if you pardon the expression, trumped up. Um, and he's, and so, what I want to get at is the degree to which the historiography there, although he was reclaiming the story in order to, to identify a forgotten moment, he was also narrativizing it in self-canceling terms as not having been a crisis at all, and therefore something that American historiography could afford to continue to overlook, which is precisely what it did for the next 30 to 40 years. What has happened since the Trump administration revived these um, and, and, and a lot of the rhetoric and a lot of the histories of these um, uh, fascist organizations in the United States from a sense um, is that historians have finally, and in my view, belatedly begun to ask the question, what would have happened if we had not started to write about this as crisis averted, but had seen, or sorry, rather, we had started to write about it as crisis averted, but not as a non-crisis. So I just want to finish with a couple of questions which is if what we're looking at right now isn't a crisis around American fascism, what would such a crisis look like? What would be the epistemic conditions that would enable us to identify a genuine political crisis while it is happening? Um, and to what degree is the attempt to separate out an authentic crisis from an inauthentic crisis, from an alarmist crisis, itself a red herring that is, that is designed to normalize and begin that process of extirpating the possibility of crisis altogether. So that there's a kind of totalizing impulse to say that if it doesn't end in catastrophe, 
it wasn't a crisis, um, which as I think brought me around to what uh, Janet put much more pithily um, in uh, her answer to the question, uh, which is what gets to count as an event. Um, and I think that the issue here is the degree to which if we continually want to define crisis averted as non-crisis, then to what degree are we doomed to keep replaying them? Thank you. Sorry, I think I went a little bit over there, sorry. Thank you so much, Sarah, that was excellent. Thank, thank you very much. Um, and I think uh, it, it's also added a dimension that we hadn't really thought about yet, you know, the, uh, the dimension of the non-crisis. You know, because I think we, we tend to think more about the alarmist crisis, the crises that are being talked up and are perhaps not, you know, crisis per se, but the non-crisis, uh, I think that's a, that's a really, really important thing to, to, to talk about as well. So uh, let's move straight into uh, our second contribution. So that's uh, Anna, please. Could you? Yeah, thank you. I think it's a, a, um, a paper that will pick up and repeat inevitably some of the points that have already been made. And as you will see, I'm going to talk about um, the temporal aspects of crisis. So firstly, I want to explore the notion of crisis as a central driver of an ever accelerating modernity. And against this background, I will then sketch a new type of crisis consciousness, which in my view has emerged in our own era of late modernity characterized by the experience of ecological, social, and economic precarization. Late modernity, I argue, is an arena in which modern speed politics and the modern conception of the present as a transmission belt for an ever brighter future have been dislodged. So ultimately, I want to argue that a new temporal disorder, if you wish, manifests itself in the prevalence of chronic crises which displace the, the logic of modern crisis management. So let me start with modern crisis, and you will know most of this, but still I think this is necessary. So from a temporal perspective, crisis consciousness is, as Reinhard Koselleck has shown, an expression of a new sense of time which indicated and intensified the end of an epoch. And of course, the French Revolution was the central event that made manifest the acceleration of history through man-made crises. As Jean-Jacques Rousseau deliberated in Emile, nous approchons de l'état de crise et de siècle de révolution, we are approaching a state of crisis and a century of revolutions. And from now on, modern man and woman inhabits a dynamic history in which time continually seems to overtake itself. And of course, this also means that modern times are times of and in perpetual crisis. And if you look at German literary and intellectual discourse from around 1800, you will find a rich metaphoric uh, of time. So terms such as Zeitgeist, Zeitangst, Zeitnot, and Zeitkrise entered public discourse, articulating a historical consciousness consciousness that registered its own contemporaneity in terms of a qualitatively new self-transcending uh, temporality. The noun crisis uh, begins to feature in the German language only after 1790. This is very interesting, very late. With first peaks in the revolutionary periods of the 1830s and 1840s, and a dramatic rise of the term during World War I and well into the 1920s. In the context of a dynamic and explosive modernity, crisis thus became a criterion of what counts as history. In other words, no history without crisis, and no crisis without history. The idea of a looming crisis always gestures to a tipping point. We've heard this before in the new future that requires urgent action in the present to prevent a catastrophe. So crises generate a particular temporality. While they unfold in the present, they create a dramatic urgency in the service of historical acceleration. They stage a state of emergency that mobilizes crisis management and crisis expertise. As a point of view, or an observation that is itself not observed, to quote Janet Reutemann, 
crises are a foundational episteme of the speed politics of modernity and its time regime. And we should, of course, note that crises entertain a double alliance with catastrophe and renewal. For the representatives of uh, the ancien regime, crisis must be controlled. But in the history of political utopianism, crises are opportunities for revolutionary change. And one shouldn't forget that this is a central aspect of this episteme of crisis as a driver of modern history. So in the remaining paper, I will argue that we are currently undergoing a shift from the notion of preventable and calculable crisis towards chronic and incalculable crisis. And the case in point is the current COVID-19 pandemic. At first sight, the global disruption caused by the virus follows the script of modern crisis and crisis management as sketched before. After its eruption and rapid progression around the globe, a whole raft of measures was designed to manage the crisis, ranging from mathematical modeling of projected infection rates and tipping points, etc., restrictions in public life to control and reduce infections and the rapid rollout of policies and the accelerated development of vaccines and, and so on. So risk assessment, the calculation of tipping points, action plans and prevention strategies are of course textbook examples of modern crisis management. And yet the drama of COVID-19 has been so drawn out that there is now widespread COVID fatigue with public officials struggling to engage the wider public. In the eyes of some, the constant repetition of tipping points and the serialized emplotment of a threat leading to the catastrophe has eroded the very idea of crisis. So as a protracted and persistent phenomenon, the pandemic has morphed into a chronic crisis that permeates everyday life. Now, Leaving COVID to one side, I want to argue that chronic crises are symptomatic of what I want to call the normative disorder of our precarized societies. Chronic crises are testimonial to the collapse of the temporal order of modernity. They lower a curtain over the future as a horizon of positive change, while also cutting off our ties to the past as a meaningful resource. Chronic crises thus lock social actors in a stagnant and at the same time atomized present that can no longer be integrated into coherent biographical and historical scripts. As Ansgar Nüning has argued, conventional crisis narratives knit together the past, the present and the future into a unifying and ultimately teleological plot. In sharp contrast, I would suggest, Chronic crises disable the process of selection, abstraction, and distinction that is necessary for the dramatization and employment of crisis narratives. While the latter pivot around turning points which engender lasting change, chronic crises are marked by a paralyzing presentism. Obviously, that notion has been hovering around for some time now, to use Francois Artaud's term. By embedding the experience of threat into the extended present without a meaning, meaningful past and future horizon, chronic crises engender exhaustion and apathy, cutting social actors off from engagement with an overly complex world. And I believe that this also explains a lot of the political apathy and the rise of populism. But let me just touch on one recent literary example that explores such chronic crises. Sibylle Berg's dystopian novel Grime, Brainfuck, that's the title in German, published in 2019, is set in a post-Brexit and post-democratic Britain in the near future, in which the majority of the population lead precarized lives. One of the more peripheral figures is a nurse working exhausting night shifts in the A&E de &E department of her hospital. And how topical is that right now, right? So of course, A&E departments are sites of acute but chronic crisis and chronic crisis intervention. So every night she encounters the wreckage of precarized society young men with stabbed out eyes, gunshot wounds and blown off hands, 
children beaten half dead and raped by their fathers, disfigured women after acid attacks and women after failed suicide attempts. And the descriptions are uh, endless and very, very graphic. So exposed to an onslaught of nightly crisis in the A&E department, the nurse suffers, suffers from an interminable exhaustion which manifests itself in her inability to imagine a better future. In fact, she is unable to imagine any future for herself at all. So the impoverishment of the imagination of Burke's character is a direct consequence of their lives being governed by chronic crises, which erode the very idea of renewal and the possibility of change. And Burke's novel is just one example of a new strand of contemporary writing and filmmaking, which explore precarity and chronic crisis through aesthetics of precariousness. And of course, that is my personal interest in, in, in uh, this issue. So to sum up, the example shows that chronic crises are latent phenomena, which are noticed only if and when they create a cumulative effect at societal or global level. In fact, chronic crises are notoriously scripted out of the crisis narratives of neoliberal society. Chronic crises are indices of what is repressed by modern crisis management, the knowledge that precariousness is the ontological condition of all life on the planet. And I leave it at that. Thank you. Again, thank you so much, Anna. Um, I think that's a, uh, that's a very, very uh, thoughtful contribution. The idea of chronic crisis reminds me of um, something I read by Astrid L. Um, recently, where she talks about the fact that the, um, the corona crisis has brought about a change in how we experience time. And that uh, it's, you know, it's, it, it's, a, it's an experience that um, uh, seems to belie linearity of time and almost goes into a circular, you know, the circularity of what we do every day and 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 uh, and the sort of non non movement of uh, uh, of time. I think that plays into that as well. Something to be thinking about a little bit later, maybe. Um, let's move on to Marek Tam, uh, please, Marek, if you could give us your talk now. Yes, I started uh, also some slide sharing. I hope it works. So first, of course, uh, many thanks to the organizers, Anna and Gradelia, for having me, and also for Anna for this uh, most inspiring talk, which also, I'd say, prepared perfectly the crown for my uh, small talk. And I have to probably apologize also that uh, my talk is not uh, directly about the concept of crisis, uh, but more about the notion of the future. However, uh, my main question will be whether our sense of the future is in crisis, as many scholars argue these days. And if yes, then what kind of crisis are we talking about? The most uh, prevalent uh, diagnosis of our current temporal condition in the Western world is that of presentism, as been already said a few times during this seminar. We are told by various authors that we live in a new time regime or regime of historicity characterized by dominance of the category of the present. French historian Francois Artaud was probably the first to argue that today's experience of time has become increasingly present oriented. According to Artaud, uh, but also uh, to many others, uh, the main feature of today's presentist regime of historicity is the crisis of the future future which was the dominant category of the previous modern regime of historicity. Our talk summarizes his main point in the following terms, and I, you have the quote. So fut futurism has sunk below the horizon and presentism has taken its place. He's seconded there, for instance, by German-American literary scholar Hans-Ulrich Kumbrecht, who wrote in 2014, another quote, the future no longer presents itself as an open horizon of possibilities. Instead, it is a dimension increasingly close to all prognosis. In brief, we are invited to accept that there is a serious crisis of the future. 
if not the very collapse of the future, to quote an article by American sociologist John Torpy from 2008. Now, while I too expose the general idea that our dominant regime of historicity is presentism, like Sarah and, and, and uh, Ame, this does not mean, in my understanding, that the future is disappearing from our horizon, devoured by the ever broadening present. Rather, I would argue that we are witnessing in these days the emergence of new modalities of the future, characteristic to the presentist regime of historicity. By the modalities of the future, I have in mind the variety of possible but not necessary, but not necessary futures uh, figured simultaneously in different societal and cultural practices. No matter how paradoxical it may sound, the presentist regime of historicity should not be defined, in my understanding, through the category of the present, but through the new modalities of the future it generates. Put differently, I don't believe that the future is in crisis or collapsing, but rather that the future is taking some new, exceptional or unprecedented shapes. My current research project, undertaken together with a colleague from the University of Bielefeld, uh, Zoltan Apoldisar Simon, here virtually present, uh, is specifically about the exploration of these new modalities of the future. The project is still in its early phase, but let me share some preliminary uh, thoughts. Our main contention in this project is that today the future looks different as relative to the past to an extent that was simply unimaginable in the modern period. New futures have emerged since recent decades, new futures which are historically way other than those scenarios of continuity that we have been accustomed to in the last two centuries or so. Instead of conveying a sense of how past and future are connected, new futures increasingly appear to us as disconnected, as ones that no longer connect to pasts. This disconnectedness between the past and the future is the main reason why the future seems to be in crisis. But I would argue that instead of the crisis, it is probably more accurate to talk about the new emerging modalities of the future. But what do we exactly mean by disconnected futures? It has already become rather commonplace to note that the Anthropocene uproots our previously held beliefs and knowledges, not least about being human and being in time. And the way this happens uh, with respect to potential Anthropocene futures is that of an abrupt change that pushes the Earth system to an entirely new condition that may no longer sustain human life. Similarly, scientific technological futures have already been considered in a similar fashion as absolute alterity. In the modern regime of historicity, all futures were exclusively human futures, while in our regime of historicity, the future modalities extend uh, beyond the human. <coughs> uh, this uh, point is uh, beyond the human future modalities is, is very well captured uh, by two Brazilian anthropologists, uh, Deborah Danowski and Eduardo Viveiros de Castro. Yeah, the code, sorry. The future ceases to be made of the same matter as the past. It becomes radically other, not ours. Now, there is certainly a rich variety of futures available in contemporary Western world. Uh, but I would argue that uh, in a very general level, we can speak about two main modalities, post-human future and transhuman future. The first mode of the future refers to a more than human world, to the world that exceeds the human. Whereas the second mode of the future points toward a better than human world, to the world that enhances the human. In the remaining part of the talk, my aim is to describe very briefly these two main modalities of the future. Let me start by the post-human modality of the future. I understand here by post-humanism the efforts to Decenter the human and to reconfigure the relationship between humans and non humans. 
Post-humanism rejects that humans are the only species capable of producing knowledge and cause changes. Post-humanism is based on a new idea of subjectivity, a transversal alliance involving both human and non-human agents. Post-humanism is not automatically generating post-human visions of the future, especially within the tradition of the so-called critical post-humanism. However, post-humanism is clearly aspiring toward a more than human future, the species-wise blurring of the human boundaries. The new awareness of the Anthrop Anthropocene is confronting us with a question, what does it mean to be human when this means to be part of a global force that changes everything, even the future of an entire planet? The post-humanist vision of future is characterized by the intensification of the interrelationship that defines the co-constitution of human with other life forms and forces of the planet. Now let's move to the second transhuman modality of the future. By transhumanism, I understand various visions to transcend the human condition by means of technology and the advancements of science, from biotechnology to nanotechnology and artificial intelligence. When posthumanism can be seen as a break from humanism, then transhumanism is an intensification of humanism inasmuch as it aims for the indefinite promotion of the qualities that have historically distinguished humans from other creatures. Transhumanism is motivated by the idea of human enhancement and to unfold in various procedures from genetic and morphological to pharmacological and cyber enhancements. Transhumanism advocates, at least in some of its branches, the expansion of life to the universe the colonization of the cosmos, as it were. While most of the transhumanists count in this on the emergence of general artificial intelligence, there, is, there are also other visionaries like Elon Musk who are working actively in space industry to, quote, Musk to make life multiplanetary and to turn humans into a multiplanetary species. The transhumanist visions of the future contains contain most often an irreversible turning point called as intelligence explosion or technological singularity, the result of an exponential process of technological progress. This turning point is the moment where the exponential kernel of technological evolution reaches the point where unprecedented and unpredictable changes take place in the blink of an eye. American visionary, Ray Kurzweil, the main advocate of the singularity theory, defines this moment in the following terms. It's a future period during which the pace of technological change will be so rapid, its impact so deep, that human life will be irreversible, irreversibly transformed. Now, if we follow Kurzweil and other transhumanists, then human life as we know it will be dif entirely different after the singularity. Now, to sum up, I believe that the word crisis is probably not the best term to make sense of the new emerging future visions. The future has not vanished nor collapsed. We are simply witnessing the rise of new disconnected futures. And it is our challenge to cope with these unprecedented modalities of the future. And there are some hints for further reading if, if interesting. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. We'll My stop wish. sharing soon. Thank you very much for bringing us back to a point that uh, we had been considering uh, early on uh, this afternoon, the, um, uh, the link of the human to the, to the post-human and the trans-human, the ecological perspective. I think that's, that's, that's great. Now, um, while well, I'll ask uh, the first questions, um, do use the chat function. Um, we, we do want to hear from you and we want to pick up your questions as well. Can I also say, uh, Sarah Churchwell has uh, told us she will need to leave a little bit early. So any questions to Sarah will be asked first. Um, I just uh, need to pick up, I think, on uh, a question that actually was in the chat function 
already um, uh, relating to the first part of uh, our seminar. And of course, it has been dominating uh, uh, this second part. Uh, is the question of temporality of, uh, of the crisis concept or crisis imaginary. Um, Sarah has been talking about um, the historiography of crisis or, or rather non-crises, so looking at the past. Um, Anna has been uh, uh, considering a new uh, type of crisis, which is the chronic crisis uh, and, and has been highlighting the presentism. And then, of course, uh, Marek um, has been talking about um, futurity and the, and the future, not as a crisis, but as something that will follow a turning point and will take a very, very different form. So this question of temporality and crisis, how, in, how interlinked are they? How, how impossible is it to think about crisis without thinking about time? And to what extent are we maybe having to think about the idea that, that time itself or the idea of time itself um, is in crisis? I would like to ask that question to um, to all three panelists. Well, I'm happy to start if it's if it's okay. Right. Yep. Yeah. I, first of all, I do agree absolutely that crisis is a temporal concept, and I just finished reading the very new book by François Artaud, which is titled Chronos, and one of his main arguments in the book is that actually three concepts, Chronos. Kairos and crisis are deeply intermingled and deeply connected. Actually, this is a conceptual triangle that actually makes sense, helps to make sense of the of the Western uh, time regime. And uh, but more specifically, I would argue that probably crisis is a conceptual tool to synchronize in nowadays the various temporalities. Uh, in a sense that, I mean, for a long time, mostly the late 19th and in the 20th century, the concept of progress uh, was playing the similar role of, of being the synchronizer of various temporal processes going on in Western societies. But now process, well, sorry, progress is, 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 is vanishing as, as a concept. And, and crisis is replacing the concept of progress. And I think indeed uh, a crisis kind of brings together all those different types of temporalities, be it economic, political, social, pandemic, or other kind of, of temporalities. And they are all yeah, um, synchronized or, or, or brought together by this idea of, of crisis. And therefore, I believe that crisis is one of the major temporal notions of our time. Yeah, I, I would, uh, I mean, I agree with uh, uh, <clears throat> Marek's uh, points. I mean, I referred to Reinhard Kasselik, who's written about this, you know, uh, all his life, in fact. Um, and um, uh, it's very clear if you look at the, um, if, um, I quoted the Rousseau um, from Emile, we are approaching a state of crisis and a century of revolutions. And then if you match this with, the evidence of the of, of a corpus of texts from German uh, from the German language, you do actually find real evidence, namely that the noun Krise, first in the modern sense, there are medical senses that are older and other senses that are older, but in the modern sense, appears for the first time in the German vocabulary in 1790. That coincides with the revolutionary period. So um, if you take this then further, you can you can show that that crisis, what, what counts as history is marked as a crisis. Throughout the 19th century into the 20th century to our own times. And at this point, of course, what we are now seeing is that this, this linearity of time uh, and of um, a time that is based and revolves around acceleration has been fundamentally dislodged. And I spoke of a, temp a new temporal disorder. Others use the, the, the notion of presentism uh, to kind of highlight, highlight uh, 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 how this modern order of time has been dislodged. I agree with Marek that this doesn't mean that there is no future anymore, but it means that 
the binding force of the future and progress have been fundamentally overturned. It's no longer possible to envisage a progressive future. Perhaps if you are a fundamentalist transhumanist, it is, but for most of us, it isn't. So uh, the, the point I was trying to make with the idea of, of chronic crisis uh, is really that, that I mean, I've, read, I've been reading about 100 novels over the summer in which chronic crises, the crises that are not noticed politically or sidelined uh, or scripted out of the modern narrative of crisis, they are the domain of literature. So my point is that literature takes care of the neglected chronic, chronic crises that mark our own time. Thank you very much, Anna. Sarah, do you want to um, come in on this as well? Yeah, I don't oh, hang on. Am I back on? Yeah. No. Now you're, now you're muted. Am I there? I was trying to, oh, I seem yeah. to be going, I seem, sorry, I seem to be toggling back and forth, apologies. Um, yeah, I don't. I, I I don't think I I um, have anything to add to that except that I was sort of drawing a similar conclusion in slightly different um, terms, which is that I feel like what I've what I've gotten from today is that uh, um, that yeah that we that it's that that we're exper that we experience accelerated temporality as a crisis epistemically, and that that's the um, that that's how we interpret that um, experience. Um, is the urgency is, is, is the urgency of temporal change is what is what feels um, as I say is, is how we interpret it. So I don't think I'm saying anything different, but I was I was drawing um, similar conclusions. And indeed, as as Anna just said, um, that 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 or in, in Janet's terms, um, what counts as an event, um, you know, that that it, that for historiography to identify it, it has to be experienced on some levels a crisis and then part of the judgment that gets the normative judgment um, um, and, and selection process that comes into historiography is about deciding which crises count. So not just what makes it an event, but then what kind of crisis is, um, is uh, sufficient to mark um, you know, a, historic, a historical rupture or however it might get um, uh, framed. And I guess that's really kind of what I was getting at was not so much that it was a non-crisis, but that it was a crisis that didn't count historiographically, right? Um, and so that it was a, a kind of non-consequential crisis. Um, and and then what I, what I was trying to suggest is that that but that if your if your if your frame of consequence shifts, what to Rabufo in 1983 looked like an inconsequential crisis in the era of Trump looks like an extremely consequential crisis. So it's that shifting almost accordioning temporality that I think is the problem for historiography to try to get a hold of. Does that mean you're losing um, the element of hope? Because, you know, if, if you're not believing in this idea of progress anymore, if you're not believing in the idea of, of crisis being a turning point to something different, something better, um, it sounds, uh, and, and I'm sort of seeing a question here, which is, uh, um, I think, linking in with, with what I'm thinking here. So this, uh, would you define our current time as more prone to be understood and represented by a dystopian perspective rather than a utopian one? Um, that seems to be linking in with that. What do you think to that? Is that, is that directed at, at me yeah. specifically? Yeah, um, yeah um, I, um, so I actually, I think there's there's two answers to that question. Um, one is personal and one is what I observe collectively, right? So personally, I don't find any loss of hope in this because it's precisely uh, because I can contextualize and situate historically what is happening now that I can make sense of it. That's what history is for. Um, actually conceptualize alternative outcomes and that I can see that the acute crisis that I think that we are in um, is disaster averted, but I can understand where it came from and then possibly see where we might go and start to say can, that we could actually envision a society in which we, if we need to find something to console ourselves with, that our consoling fiction, as I say, is that we successfully averted disaster, not that disaster was never in the offing. It seems to me that that would actually be a more productive 
uh, kind of storytelling for a society to do. In terms of dystopian energies at the moment, do I see much collective energy in that direction? No, I do not. Um, not at the moment. I don't see that being where most people's um, narrativizing impulses are going right now. But, uh, but for me, that's the whole point of the exercise is to say that we could surely what we can do through this kind of analysis is to identify more constructive kinds of narrative and, and, and you know, imaginary and political discourses that we construct to make sense of all of this. And that what we're seeing in the United States, in my view, is, uh, I believe, an acute crisis in the idiomatic sense that is brought on by uh, um, an acute and, I think, pathological inability to confront the realities of our own history. Um, and, that, that, and that it is just, you know, it's the Arendtian um, facts coming home to roost in a society of chronic lying. Um, and that's what history has to be able to do for us. And so what interests me is where historiography, with the best of intentions, actually contributes to that myth making, even though it's not necessarily bad history in the crude sense. Um, it's a very sophisticated history, but it actually contributes to that project. Thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, Anna, uh, Marek, do you want to come in to, on that? Yeah, yeah I do. I, I wanted to, I was thinking about this question uh, <clears throat> about utopianism, and I would, from my perspective, I think I would answer it as follows, namely that I think that the kind of political utopianism of the 19th and 20, early 20th century, early 20th century is no longer possible, uh, merely because it is steeped in the problematic conception of time and the pro pro uh, problematic conception of human agency that disregards um, what you might want to call the, relation, the relationality and interconnectedness of life on the planet. So I think one would need to rethink utopianism from a post-humanist perspective that takes account of the vulnerability of, of, uh, of life and, and actually reconceptualizes uh, human agency moving away from the neoliberal uh, notion of the resilient, autonomous, and, and entrepreneurial subject, which has dominated um, at least the recent agenda, but probably, I mean, the neoliberalism is a relatively new phenomenon, but its precursors have a long tradition. So I think in order to salvage, and we need, we need, a, we need a Benjaminian messianic hope, notion of hope, or something like that anyway, and something that, um, enables us to, to um, think of another future. We, we need to be able to think of another future. So there needs to be that utopian impulse, but it can't be a, a political utopianism as a coherent vision of the good life. That's my answer. Okay. Yes, and I, I do very much agree with Anna here. I can add maybe that um, it seems to me indeed that at the level of society and also at the level of, of arts, there is a certain incline toward uh, the dystopian visions of the future, probably because uh, of this aspect that Janet earlier raised that, you know, funding bodies and society and audiences may be more interested in those kind of apocalyptic scenarios and this very, you know, eventual uh, phenomena. Uh, while I believe, like Anna, that actually we need much more those positive utopian scenarios. And, and also in my mind, the, the utopia we need is a post-human utopia, maybe less than the transhuman dystopia. So um, this would be maybe our, our duty nowadays to provide our readers, our students with these new type of, of, of post-humanist uh, utopias that might help us to to get out of this uh, current feeling of, 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 of crisis and of the presentist uh, time regime. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I am going to um, say goodbye to Sarah. <laughs> oh. And I'm also going to pick up um, one of the questions in the chat here. Um, Phil, Phil Cohn, um, do you want to ask your question? Uh, Phil is not unmuting, so I'll, I'll just uh, read out his question. Um, is not this accelerated and disconnected temporality symptomatic of a more general phenomenon of chaotic synchronicity characteristic of global capitalism? 
I can maybe very shortly comment that I do agree that we can easily connect the, the concept of the regime of historicity of presentism with the rise of the neoliberal capitalism. There is an inherent connection that capitalism kind of produces this presentist uh, uh, time regime and supports it. And in this respect, when we were just talking about these positive utopias, I think these have to include uh, also the utopia, how to overcome this type of, 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 let's call it neoliberal or digital capitalism. Okay. So there is a connection, uh, I believe, uh, between the, this, um, our current temporal condition and our current economic okay. condition. I think, Anna, you probably agree with that, don't you? Yeah, I do, but I want to just throw a spanner in the works and say that, of course, you know, this, this idea of global synchronicity has to be problematized too. And I would do this with, with reference just very briefly to David Harvey's notion of uneven geographical development, right? Uh, we do not uh, inhabit a synchronized, synchronized uh, a totally synchronized world. Uh, and inequality, you know, if you th think about temporality, slowness, acceleration and access and uneven distribution of all of these things, uh, you know, you arrive at a very varied um, temporality across the globe, uh, which, you know, that's another, that's a can of worms. But, but just to say, David Harvey's notion of uneven geographical development, we should bear that in mind. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Um, and it, you know, to a certain extent, that brings us back to Joe's uh, uh, Joe's contribution uh, in the first part. You know, where really we we have to be aware of other voices. Um, Joe, do you want to come in here or? Um... Uh, I can do. Yeah. Um, yeah, I agree with what's been said, and um, I I suppose I felt slightly uh, pessimistic at the end of that session um but i'm i'm seeing i mean marik i i really uh i think you're right i agree with you about different about you know moving with different modalities into the future and i think what we need to be as godel is saying is aware of um the work we're doing with different communities and the way those different communities are experiencing whether it's crisis or not. And I, mean, I'm, I find myself asking the question, I, I wanted to ask the question about crisis and, and criticism here, because I, I felt like when I was reading uh, someone like Rebecca Bryant, there was this link established between, I think it was Rebecca Bryant who established this link between crisis and criticism. And I wondered, I mean, I wanted to ask Anne first and then Marit perhaps to follow up the, the question might, um, uh, be, be uh, applicable to both of you. Um, but the, the question is, uh, what do you think about that uh, possibility of using crisis, a uh, moment of crisis for criticism and kind of self-reflection, a self-reflexive moment that could enable us to kind of think about, uh, think critically about how we move into the future? Um, or are you, are you quite pessimistic about that? It's my question to, to Anne first, I think. Well, I suppose I would um, answer that question with reference to what we're doing today, namely uh, criticizing a particular crisis narrative collectively and discursively and from various disciplinary perspectives. So I hope that this seminar or workshop today is a contribution to re-establishing the link between critique and crisis. Yeah, that is often forgotten when you are kind of sucked into the drama of, of crisis narration and especially a, a current crisis narration, which um, assumes a false objectivity through graphs. When I was preparing the seminar, I was thinking about doing something about these constant graphs with, you know, um, dramatic tipping points and infection rates and, and all sorts of things you can do with these graphs, they, they assume or they project um, a problematic notion of objectivity that disguises lots of other things. And I think this kind of seminar is, of course, an attempt to reestablish 
that link between critique and crisis. I hope I've answered it um, sufficiently. And I also just wanted to thank you that bringing up this connection between critique and, and, and crisis, because they are indeed etymologically connected. They refer the same um, Greek uh, word. And, and actually Reinhard Koselek has a small book, Critique und Krise, which elaborates on this very connection. And, and I think it's important because originally the meaning of, 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 of crisis is indeed to make a difference, to make a distinction, to kind of, uh, one can say, to analyze it. So every crisis should be a call for criticism, for critique in the, in the sense of, of analysis. And that's in, indeed what we are doing today, making sense of crisis by using critical tools. Thank you so much. Uh, Anna and Marek, that's what, what you were just saying sounds like, you know, perfect sort of closing statements. But I do want to give the option to our other speakers to maybe, you know, say something, you know, uh, at, as their closing statement or throw up a different question that they think we haven't answered and we should be addressing next. Um, Janet, do you want to kick off? Sure, yeah. Maybe I can just pick up where we left off because um, I did sort of start anti-crisis with Kaselik's work. Um, but I guess um, the best way to do this is to link back, unfortunately, uh, this, this question that was posed in the presentation about like, does the Trump regime represent a crisis, a fascist crisis in this country or or not, you know, I mean, I'm not going to go over the argument, but I would just like to say that, like, if we link that to this question of critique and crisis, to what extent do these crises engender critique? And I mean critique in the fullest sense, not just criticism of a government or criticism of the way something's being managed, right, but the fullest sense, in Kaselik's sense. So I'm skeptical of that. I mean, I, you could say one thing that uh, the history that was presented you know, is, is, is really that this country was founded on white supremacist rule. <laughs> and it's not a crisis. <laughs> it's just a manifestation of the way this country uh, was founded and has been governed. So, th so that's one point. So it, one is, I don't know whether crisis is obtained, and two, I don't really necessarily see critique in the fullest sense, yeah. having uh, been engendered from that. And the second point is, and I know that's very negative, I have two... 20 year, twenty some year old children, so I try not to be very dystopic, actually. Uh, and I actually, I, I say that kiddingly, but I, I, I think it's important. I guess the other thing I, I just would close on, and this is the anthropologist in me speaking. You know, we're speaking as in these universalist terms. You know, history is this, and temp, you know, I, I guess it would be interesting to explore more fully. You know, what counts as a, as as an event is also like what does an event in from an epistemological point of view um, even signify for various populations? Or what does time signify for various populations? To maybe think about the universality, universalizing tendencies of our own uh, ways of narr narrativizing. So. Great, thank you very much. Uh, Anska? Thank you very much. Um, I completely agree that these were wonderful closing statements, but like Janet, I'd like to make at least two modest additions. One is I think we should move beyond critique. Uh, I think critique is incredibly important, but I think at this stage, problem solving is even more important. And I think anyone involved in literary studies, cultural studies, anthropology and history should also show that we could potentially be very important for solving the problems. Problems like sense making, meaning making, uh, staying healthy, it's not just a question of lowering numbers of infections, but also giving people something sensible to do. Uh, so this would be my first point. My second point is just to follow up on what Anna said. Uh, I think we need a sustained debate in public and uh, academe about our notions of good life. I think at the moment, uh, there's no public conception of health Health is just not being infected, whereas well-being, as we all know, there's so much more to it than just not catching this goddamn virus. So I think what we should have is 
um, a debate about notions of what could constitute a good life, no, uh, debates about hierarchies of values, about revalorization. I think this is where the humanities, anyone doing literary or cultural studies really comes in. And we should go beyond just critique. This would be my closing statement. A plea for problem solving, a plea for pragmatism, and a plea for uh, really initiating this debate about a good life. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, very, very, um... I was going to say utopian, but no, it's not utopian. I, I know if we put our work into it, it's uh, it's absolutely achievable. And Joe, you, it falls to you to say the last word. Thank you. I'm not sure I can do better than than uh, than Ansgar there, but I I would just just again reiterate what the speakers have, have already said, and perhaps to say. Um, that in my in my view, that problem solving, that pragmatism, is already going on in many inventive ways in communities, uh, in multilingual communities, in, in in communities we do not take notice of. To pick up on what Janet saying there, and I think uh, if we orient our research in one direction, it can be into those communities and uh, to do some some proper uh, listening and learning from those communities. Um, uh, especially uh, thinking of, of languages here. So I'll, I'll just end there. So uh, thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much to all our speakers and to the audience and for your, all your questions. It really was a very, very rich discussion, I feel, and I've, I've, I've learned a lot. Thank you. Well, I want to, I want to echo this and, and say, uh, just to, to emphasize once more, that this has been an example of this wonderful collaboration of the IMLR with the UCD Humanities Institute. And um, we, I'm looking forward to uh, future events online, but also on site, frankly. <laughs> It'd be <laughs> nice to, to return to that kind of experiential dimension where you can have informal chats over a coffee. Wouldn't that be wonderful? So thank you to the oh, yeah. audience you have your questions have been fantastic really engaging thank you for all the panelists and uh, your great contributions and i really do hope that um, we can assemble perhaps in in dublin next year that would be just great and follow up follow up and take it further we can now think about it and and uh, consider what the most pressing issue might be to take it to take it to the next level. So from me and Gorilla and bye bye. Thank you very much and enjoy your day and evening on whatever time zone you are. And stay healthy, stay well, and stay zen. Bye bye. <laughs>